Welcome to Beyond the Press Release, a production of Gore Calm, in which we take the time to speak with small cap executives about recent important developments in their company or in their industry. With us today, I'm really happy to have again Frank Smeek. He's President and CEO of KWG Resources, trades on the stock symbol KWG on the CSE, that's the Canadian Securities Exchange. And of course, you can find him on the web at kwgresources.com. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the story, KWG holds an interest in two significant chromite deposits in the Ring of Fire. That's the region 500 kilometers northeast of Thunder Bay that's been the subject of a lot of media and industry attention over the last couple of years. Uh, and is home to the fourth largest chromite reserve in the world. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the press release that kind of put out on March 23rd in which they announced that KWG and Norant Resources uh, would be sitting down to talk after the proposed acquisition of uh, Cliff's Chromite was announced by Norant Resources. With us today to talk about that is Frank. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. It's good to be back. All right, so uh, you and I were just speaking a few days ago and didn't expect to be back on so soon. Uh, some big news that came out of left field here with the proposed acquisition, uh, $20 million plus acquisition uh, by Norant Resources of, the, of, uh, of Cliff's, Cliff's Chromite interest. Let's get, we've got a lot of questions, a lot of cool questions we've seen online as well. Let's get straight to the first one, which is, uh, what are the implications uh, to KWG of Noron acquiring the Cliffs Chromite assets? Um, I'm not sure there's, there's that many to KWG. I think it's business as usual for KWG. I think the implications for uh, Ontario and for Canada are uh, uh, perhaps even profound. Uh, it, it's collecting the assets into, into one ownership uh, with uh, you know, a, an associated uh, fellow junior company that is uh, devoted to uh, developing this area, developing this uh, mineral uh, resource, uh, new discovery area, and uh, providing infrastructure to it. I, I think it's, it's just great news, uh, quite honestly. Now, Al Coote uh, of Norn, he's a CEO of Norn Resources. He reached out uh, to invite you to come and discuss future plans. I did notice in the press release yesterday that you said, and I want to quote, uh, we're hopeful that a relationship with our big daddy joint venture partner will become more constructive and collaborative. So uh, are you referring there to Noron or your previous partnership? And uh, tell us about what the status is of your relationship with, uh, with Nora and with, uh, and with Al Kud specifically. Well, just the, the um, Al's reaching out uh, in advance of issuing the press release was, uh, you know, very typical of, of the man and of Norant. It's, it's just a class act. Um, the uh, collaboration or the lack of collaboration, uh, we've, ne we've never, um, you know, we've, we've been competitive to some extent with Norant, so we've never um, uh, had a need to collaborate. We've never shared um, a mineral asset. Uh, if and when uh, the acquisition from Close is completed, we will be um, in a joint venture with Norant on the Big Daddy deposit, but we'll, we'll be uh, needing and wanting very much to collaborate on the, um, on the plan forward for um, assisting Ontario to create the infrastructure that, that the assets of both companies need. And I, and I guess the lack of collaboration is no secret. Uh, would refer to um, the owner that's about to to not be the owner, which is Cliffs. Uh, they didn't, you know, they, they were not uh, collaborative with us in the development of the Big Daddy. They chose to uh, pro pro propound a, a plan to develop the Black Thor in part um, so that, uh, you know, we would have to wait a while to, uh, to realize um, our future for our shareholders. So um, that, that's what that's all about. In the past, uh, it seems like transportation and processing options have been a bit of a sticking point in what to do up there in the Ring of Fire. Now that you've got uh, Noron effectively becoming your, your partner there on Big Daddy, how does that change things when you sit down and speak with Al Coots about uh, the best way to work out the transportation and processing issues? Um, you know, the, the three companies um, had their own um, indi very individual visions of um, how best to um, uh, how best to develop the mineral assets that they that they controlled. And in Noron's case and in Cliff's case, they um, they have been proponents of an environmental assessment based on a uh, big investment in uh, in uh, data uh, accumulation. In Cliff's case, it uh, was uh, in part. Um, with the concept that uh, they should be granted an easement by 
the province of Ontario over top of the claims that uh, KWG had made an investment in. Um, in Noron's case, they have uh, invested time and money in, in studying and uh, coming to grips with um, a route into the Ring of Fire area, um, which comes from the west and, and comes comes east uh, from the west. We have looked at an alternative to uh, to, to their particular uh, routing, but uh, um, I, I think that's small beer, if you will, because that is a supply road. It's it's like uh, you know the 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 way in to get material in to do the big job, which is something that will go north south in the fullness of time. Um, we've concluded that it, it probably won't be a railroad. There's not enough. Um, there's not enough um, economic mineral or not enough bulk of economic mineral up there to justify the capital cost, uh, the depreciation of capital cost of a railroad. And, and we've concluded that it might well be a, uh, a slurry pipeline, which is much more environmentally benign. It goes in the ground and under the rivers rather than, uh, you know, across the rivers on train trestles and so on. Um, the Cliffs Road, I think, um, the idea of trucking has been discredited. Um, the uh, but but Noron makes a very good point that with a supply road in, uh, the first uh, likely production is to come from their nickel deposit, and and that can be driven out um, on the road that uh, that that brings supplies in. So I, I think we'll be able now to share data and uh, look at. Uh, look at the practicalities uh, of uh, what's needed for each of the businesses. And there are two businesses here. The one, uh, the one is a national, is it perhaps international business, which is the entry of Canada uh, via Ontario, via the Ring of Fire, into a global market for chrome and its uh, derivative products, uh, stainless steel and, and stainless steel feedstock materials. And the other is nickel, which is a, uh, an LME terminal market. It's uh, much better understood and um, uh, Noron's deposit uh, looks to be uh, um, a highly profitable prospect for production for a uh, space of time, and and that I think is uh, going to be, you know, a catalyst in the development of the Ring of Fire and the financing of the infrastructure that's needed to to develop both businesses. Uh, and on to, on that note, uh, in an article today, uh, Al Kutz was interviewed, and I can't remember I can't remember the source, but I got a quote here where it said. Uh, Coots would like to begin extracting nickel within three years and chromite within five years. Um, how do you feel about that statement, and uh, and how do you address that when you when when you speak with Al directly? Uh, well, we uh, we usually uh, address each other over a beer, just to make that clear. So, uh, um, I, I think yeah, nickel nickel is a uh, is straightforward. Um, you know, their plan it's it's an underground mine. It, it's sort of the shape of a of a carrot. Um, it is um, it, it's uh, relatively mineable, and, and then it, it is millable uh, on their plan, and it makes a concentrate. That concentrate is very high value; it can be shipped out to uh, through the uh, over to the Pickle Lake Highway, and then down to the railroad, and um, onward to Sudbury for uh, smelting and refining. Uh, the chrome business, you know, we really if if uh, the Ring of Fire is to be developed to its full full uh, potential. Um, what, what is uh, in front of us is the, the entry of, of North America and, uh, and, and via Canada and via the Ring of Fire, as I said, into a global market for uh, this uh, important stainless steel constituent. And that will take a little bit of time. We have to earn our market share and we have to do that with uh, a very competitive uh, costing um, advantages that we appear to have. If we if we use the available um, the available technology and the available assets and combine those with the very high grade of the uh, chrome deposits in the Ring of Fire and, and uh, the humongous size of them, they're going to be producing for uh, for a century and beyond. So it's great to hear that the two of you, the two biggest players in the Ring of Fire, are going to be getting together to discuss the future and, and uh, try and work through all these issues to reach consensus. The other two parties that comes up hand in hand with the Ring of Fire are the governments, specifically the provincial and federal governments. What do you think this does to them in terms of uh, sending them the message that the Ring of Fire is uh, is a serious place? Franco Nevada has gotten involved in 
are they finally going to actually move from speaking and get into action as, as a result of this? What do you think this does to them in terms of motivation? Um, you know, the early indications uh, with uh, conversations I've had in the last uh, uh, day um, is that uh, it should galvanize them. I mean, this is uh, this is an important breakthrough, and, and I hope that uh, they, they will understand, um, you know, all problems are not solved by big uh, multinational New York listed companies. There's nothing wrong uh, with the... Uh, with the skill and the uh, the capacity of uh, junior companies that have the aspiration of becoming uh, producing mining companies, that's that's what built Canada, and that's what we're particularly good at. And I think the uh, uh, the sponsorship of uh, of the uh, spectacularly successful uh, uh, people and enterprise that that Franco Nevada is um, is uh, very very significant. If I were if I were a, uh, um, a member of the legislature, I would I would I would take note. This is um, uh, this is uh, bringing bringing the thing home, you know, in, in a in a very uh, galvanizing way, in my opinion. Safe to say that that caught you pleasantly surprised to see uh, to see Noron backed by uh, about 22, 22 million dollars plus out of Franco Nevada to make this happen. Absolutely, I have the highest regard for for those people. I've known them for many many years. Um, it, 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 uh, it's a wonderful sponsorship. It's, it's good to see. Um, one last question before I get on to the big question I have for you. But uh, there's, you, know, uh, you can't have this conversation without talking about First Nations. Um, what, does this, uh, what does this do in terms of uh, helping, move, helping move forward the discussions with First Nations? Does it bring you closer because now you have uh, two parties that are more motivated, uh, do you approach? Uh, do you find that your approach and the approach of Norrant Resources are come from different angles? How does this? How does this impact the First Nations and, and getting to terms with them? It it it's, um, it impacts them a great deal, and, and that was the point of um, of um, Al's message to me uh, early yesterday. Is um, you, you know we have to do this in partnership with the First Nations. That's something. That's a it's a it's a it's a mantra of his. It's a mantra of mine. Um, I think we've uh, both of us uh, invested in coming to understand um, the uh, the requirements and the aspirations of the First Nations uh, somewhat differently. Noron's been uh, 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 very uh, active and uh, made a big investment in uh, making themselves and the project and the, the potential for the development. Um, informed in the communities that are that are going to be affected um, I uh, in the case of KWG we don't we, we haven't had quite the same resources as Norant has had to uh, to uh, you know, proselytize the um, opportunity but we've spent a lot of time with um, uh, minister uh, um, minister David Zimmer uh, and his staff amongst other uh, members of government and uh, coming to grips with the legal issues that uh, are at play here. This is, you know, it's only 1992 that the Constitution Act uh, of Canada enshrined uh, traditional rights, and um, we're still the the, the how those um, are dealt with. The business end of uh, those rights is, is still very much an evolving thing, and so I think the collaboration of Norant and uh, KWG and um, how to bring that together um, will be very, very productive, and that, that was a, a point that Al made, and it, it's uh, I, I uh, support it uh, 100%. Now, here's the big question. We've seen this online more than a few times over the last 24 hours. Uh, I can't get through this interview without asking you, which is, doesn't it make sense to take that final last step, potential last step, and is it practical to make that last step of considering a merger between KWG and Noron and completely bring together the interest there, or are there unforeseen stumbling blocks or implications that we all can't see? Um, it, it is, uh, it's on everyone's mind. Uh, don't forget the third party and the fourth party, which is uh, the First Nations and, and the government. Uh, the infrastructure is, is a responsibility of government, um, and um, the Proposals that have been made, um, including ours, uh, see an opportunity to have the First Nations actually 
take ownership or, or management of uh, infrastructure that is actually on the ground in their traditional territories and perhaps use that as a transportation authority to finance uh, the expansion of the infrastructure into you know a, a lengthening of the, the of the railroad and uh, the addition to that of a slurry pipeline and, and perhaps even the um, underground hoisting uh, to make that make sense uh, governments are not in the business of uh, uh, creating infrastructure or uh, uh, for, for a monopoly. So uh, the fact that we have two companies and two distinct businesses uh, assists, I think, the project finance, if I can put it that way, uh, for the creation of the infrastructure. So you would have two um, new uh, producing mining companies paying tolls uh, to use whatever, whatever it is they need to use. Um, as it happens, our Black Horse Chromite deposit, uh, which uh, can be economically mined from underground, in our opinion, and the um, Eagle's Nest Nickel deposit, which Norant uh, proposes to mine first, uh, can both be mined from a single shaft, and that perhaps describes something, uh, a bit of an innovation in uh, in Canadian mining, but perhaps that that hoisting infrastructure that can uh, make two, mu two uh, underground deposits economic could be provided by a corporation that's managed by the First Nations. And, and they can do very well from uh, tolls paid for the use of that infrastructure, just to use an example. That's been our thesis. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, um, you know, that that's universally shared, but those are the kinds of conversations that uh, we now need to have and, um, you know, make a decision on one way or the other. I'm going to leave the last word with you because I anticipate that we're going to have a number of these conversations uh, in the coming days, weeks, uh, days and weeks for sure, especially as you hold the secretive summit with Al Coots that we're all going to, everyone's going to try and scramble to find out where it is and try and do a whisper 2000 and hear what you have to say. But before we sign off, uh, any last words? What should investors be looking for? What should they, what should they, they be taking comfort in and what should they be looking for in the coming days and weeks? Um, you know, I'd have to say, gee, stop feeling so bad. You know, this is really good news. Um, there is, uh, there, there is hope. There's, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel here. Uh, both these companies are are valued in the market at a fraction of uh, of uh, values that they've had in the past, and uh, arguably they're worth uh, vastly more today than they were than they were then. Um, uh, Franco Nevada has uh, put their money where their mouth is, and uh, you know I, I, I think it's enormously positive. And I, and I think our our premier and, and uh, her cabinet will uh, uh, will rise to to uh, will, will rise to the leadership of, of the likes of Franco Nevada and um, RCF, the the other financial sponsor of uh, Nora. Well, Frank, I have to say I, I concur with that. I think it is great news, and uh, I think I, I speak on behalf of all shareholders everywhere, including those of Cato with you, and even those of Noron, where we say, uh, you know, Godspeed, good luck in having your conversations with Al and all the other conversations. Al Coots, I shouldn't say Al because we don't know each other, so I shouldn't be too familiar, but with Al Coots and, and uh, the First Nations and, and, and the provincial and federal governments in getting this done and moving forward so that we can create uh, great prosperity for the country and great prosperity for some very patient and loyal shareholders over these years. I agree. Thank you, George. You've been watching Frank Smeek. He's President and CEO of KWG Resources, trades in the stock symbol KWG on the Canadian Securities Exchange. You can find him on the web at kwgresources.com. And as always, get to Agoracom, punch in the, uh, punch in the company symbol KWG, get into the discussion forum, and get active uh, with your fellow shareholders and prospective investors. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you very, very soon uh, next time.